right, good morning, everybody. If you have your Bible, I'm going to tell you to go to a really easy spot. Go to the book of Revelation, all the way in the back. You don't have to search, don't have to do the table of contents, just go to your concordance in the back and keep turning left. So we'll be there, but in this series, it's called Dear Church. We're going to look at, uh, take some time to read, examine, and learn from some of the seven letters that we believe that God penned to the seven churches. I don't know what translation Bible you have in your hand, but some translations will show that at the beginning of the book of Revelation, the letters are written in red, which tells us that these are the words of Jesus. And so from Jesus, written by the Apostle John, and they're for us today. And so automatically, I know, as soon as I say the book of Revelation, I don't want you to think I'm going to have some big chart and some pictures of all of the crazy animals and the, the seals and the bowls and the trumpets and all that stuff. But we automatically think that Revelation is just a book about judgment. But in the grand scope of Revelation and where it fits in Scripture and the real intention behind it, it's not a book of judgment. Now, I do need to let you know it does talk about it. And we all have a day of reckoning for our actions here on earth, but it's not a book of judgment. Rather, I want you to look at it as a book of warning. It's really about a heavenly father who loves his children. And he puts his arms around his sons and daughters, that's you and me, and he has a talk with them. So think about Revelation as that. And so what does he say, specifically in the beginning with these letters? And the real question is, are we going to pay attention? Because it's as if when we open the book of Revelation, we get a moment with God where he might say, first of all, I love you. And I'm proud of you. I'm happy about what you're doing over there. But can I give you some advice? I just want to talk and let you know that I'm concerned. Because where you are headed, where you're going, will lead to hurt and challenges and pain and if anyone has a personality like mine, you hear all that and they have to add one more thing and he says, this is not a threat. It's a warning. So the question is, will we pay attention and listen to the warnings in these letters? Now, when you say Revelation on a Sunday morning, you have to give context. You have to give some background. Because when you look at these seven letters, there's a contemporary view that a lot of people have, and you may have heard of it, that these letters are to seven specific churches in seven literal locations, and they're designed and written just for them. But we hold a composite view in the Assemblies of God that these letters are written, yes, to those seven churches, but they're meant for all churches in all ages, including us today. So you always have two angles when you look at Scripture, specifically letters, Letters like Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians and even Revelation. You have to ask, what did it mean and what does it mean? What did it mean to them and what does it mean for us today? If you do one without the other, you're going to get confused and sometimes you're going to get misled. So now these letters, there's seven of them. They're part of the book of Revelation. They're part of the bigger story. But Revelation itself is part of an even bigger story because you have to understand what was going on in the world at that time. And it gives you a clear picture of what God might be saying to them and to us. Now, the book of Revelation, if you love history, you're going to love this next part. If you don't, sorry, just pay attention. I even have pictures in case you like pictures. Uh, the book of Revelation, was, we know that it was written likely at the very end of the first century, again by John. It was written when the Roman emperor Domitian was in power. But in order to understand Domitian, we got to go all the way back to Julius Caesar. And some of you, if you were a fan of Shakespeare like mine, yes, that Julius Caesar, you know, et tu brute, uh, all that stuff. No, I guess nobody else likes Shakespeare like I did. One of the greatest works of Shakespeare, but I'm not going to, nobody cares. So we're just going to, but this is Julius Caesar. He's all the way to the left there. Now, he was around long before the time of Jesus. And we know from history and even from Shakespeare that he was brutally murdered by his own men. And his successor was actually his adopted son named Augustus. And he wanted to honor his father Julius. So he made a decree that stood for as long as Rome stood. That every Caesar, the emperor of Rome, was to be deified. So every emperor from that point on would also need to be known as a son of God. 
It would not be anything weird for people to not just walk around and say, Hail Caesar, but they would also say, Caesar is Lord. So you can see now that the followers of Jesus in the Roman Empire are going to have a collision course at some point. So Augustus would have a few sons, and they would be called the Judeo-Claudians. And one of the most famous ones that we know is Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero was a ruthless man, but he was also assassinated by his own guards. And things in Rome began to unravel. There would be three different emperors that would rise to power and fall away from power all within one year. That's pretty crazy. That's like, I'm not even going to compare it to today. That three rise to power, three fall from power in one year. And then things would change and stabilize when a Roman general named Vespasian would start a new dynasty called the Flavian Empire. And he would be succeeded by his two sons. One of them would be Titus. When Titus stepped into power, there would begin the rise of anti-Semitism towards the people of God and towards Christ followers. He would be the one that would rip down the temple in Jerusalem and burn it to the ground. And when he lost power, his brother came to power, Emperor Domitian, and he would continue to press forward. He would continue to pressure the people of God, continue heavy persecution against Jews and Christ followers. It would go to a whole new level. And so you need to understand all of these ancient emperors and what they're doing because this is the time period of the book of Revelation. All of this is happening in the world around them. So why does that even matter? Because we can see the progression of how the community of believers have been besieged by Rome. So the book of Revelation has a very deterministic feel to it. There are challenges. There are pressures. Persecution is mounting. But in the midst of all of it, if you listen to the words of Jesus and to John, we become aware of a God who sees us during our trials. So I want to pause there and let you know God sees you in your trial. It's, the, it's a, a testament to the Old Testament where God would see people. Very intimate Hebrew word. God sees you in your rough place. He sees what's going on. He sees all of that and He knows you. He's with you. Maybe someone needs to hear this today. He still has strength for you when you feel like you don't. To these Christians and to us, you are not defeated. You might feel overwhelmed. You might feel like you have been overcome. Paul would tell us you might feel pressed down, shaken together, and shaken up. And you might feel defeated. You might feel like there's no hope. And you might ask yourself, where is God in all of this? These seven churches are asking the same questions. And God would use John to tell them God sees you and you are not defeated. When we come to God, Jesus plants a seed of life in you and in me that cannot be snatched up by anybody else. It can't. He plants seeds of strength in us that cannot be uprooted by anything that would come against us. And this is John's charge to these churches. This is the landscape of what we're reading in Revelation. There's pain. There's real pain. There's hardship. There's trouble. There's persecution. These letters will speak directly to these realities, but these letters will also deal with very specific things like faith versus culture. Identity issues in and around the church when it pertains to ethnic and racial division. Theological issues versus sociological issues. So again, to understand these letters, you need to understand where Revelation is coming from, but I need to set something else foundational. Revelation is, is written to these seven churches and to us, but these seven churches actually have their beginning all the way back in the book of Acts. And we need to pause for a moment and go to Acts chapter 15. And if you love business meetings, you love Acts chapter 15. It's the first church business meeting. Everybody said, awesome, right? It's the Council of Jerusalem. This is where the major issues are coming up. Security and faith, culture. And it's life after Jesus. Life after the Holy Spirit has been given. So you get to the Council of Jerusalem and there's a specific theme that keeps coming up. And it comes up a lot in multiple time periods throughout church history. 
And it comes to a head in Acts 15. When people start following Jesus and they don't look like the Jewish people and they don't act like the Jewish people, they're called Gentiles, what do we do? What do we do with these Gentile believers? Do we allow them to remain Gentile or do we force them to be Jewish? Do we force them to follow the Old Testament law? Do we force them to follow the customs? And so the Council of Jerusalem was convened to tackle this tough decision. God bless them, right? And you know the Pharisees are there. And they demand that the Gentiles become circumcised because that was the mark of being right before God. But thank goodness Peter was there, right? Peter's the guy that you need to have somebody in the room to call for question because he'll keep talking. But he's there and he reminds everybody what happened in Acts chapter 10 when he went to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius found the Lord and he received the Spirit of the Lord and he was a Gentile. And then Paul and Barnabas are there. And they said, hold on everybody, we've been around the ancient world all throughout the Roman Empire and we have, seen the same, we have seen the same Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead, they're in the lives of the Gentiles. And then James is there, the younger brother of Jesus, and he begins to quote the Old Testament prophet Amos. And he says, don't you remember that God said he would pour out his Spirit on all people? And so from this, the Jerusalem Council, I'm sure they have some heated debate and they adjourn for lunch and come back. And they make a decision. And here's the official verdict. In Acts 15, verses 28 and 29, I love how they start this. It says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. What a way to like, even if you're about to say something so harsh and make them follow rules, it says, hold on, first of all, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. To not burden you, to not burden you Gentiles with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. And then they called for a motion to end the meeting, and it was adjourned. But that was the tension. If Gentiles, non-Jews, find Jesus, this is what would be required of them, and no one would be able to lay greater burdens on them than these necessary things. It's the original verdict of the council. If you notice, it's not about commands anymore. As much as it is about establishing a new moral code. It focuses again on three things. Don't eat meat that was given to idols. It's talking about idolatry. Talking about blood. It's shorthand for bloodshed or murder. And number three, sexual immorality. Those three. And if you notice, if you're really a student of the law, these are a great summation of the Ten Commandments. If you take the first five... You can really sum it up in the first part of that moral code. No idols, nothing before God, nothing before your relationship with God. You take the second five commandments, how we relate with each other, you can sum it up in no murder or no sexual immorality. Now, it doesn't seem fair. I don't know if there's anybody in the room saying, that doesn't seem fair. Because the Jews sitting in the room are saying, so you're saying they've got to follow three, and I have to follow 613. Not fair. It's like I'm the oldest and I, got to, I had to follow all 613 rules in my house. My sister's born, my brother's born. They only got to follow three. You younger kids know what it's like. I don't. I, I was the guinea pig. I was the test. But they're established. They're actually ratified by the early church. And they were called later in the first and second century. These are of utmost importance. In fact, it has been said that even at a council of rabbis, They made a decree that if your life is being threatened by Rome and you are facing severe persecution that prevent you from following the law of God, these three are all that matter now. And it's deeper than a moral code. It's establishing that these new followers of Jesus who come from this culture, you will now devote your life to following Him. Even in the midst of your culture or your family that's far away from Jesus. So again, let's put ourselves in their shoes to understand these letters. This would actually cut to the heart of Roman culture. At this time, any Roman city you go to, one of the first things you would notice would be all the temples of worship, all of their gods. They were devoted to the worship of many pagan gods. It was paganism at its peak. You had to consult God or worship God for anything and everything. And so when they talk about not eating meat sacrificed to idols... 
That's a bigger challenge than we realize. That's not you saying, well, I don't want the filet, I'll just take the New York strip. This is, the majority of the meat sold in the marketplace had been sacrificed to idols. So you are taking a staple food and you are removing it from their diet. It was idolatry. What about the shedding of blood? If Rome is known for anything, Rome is known for idolizing the blood sport. It's where we get gladiators. Think of the Colosseum. At one point, the Colosseum would be devoted to the mass murder of who? Christians. Anyone who would not devote their allegiance to Rome, you went to the Colosseum. Not to watch the show, you were part of the show. They idolized murder. They devalued life. And so now these followers of Jesus in this culture, you live above that. You value life. You don't idolize murder. And Rome was also known for its idolization of sexual immorality and fornication. It was everywhere. It was celebrated. It became part of their idol worship. It pervaded every aspect of culture and it would even become part of the downfall of Rome. And so these followers of Jesus are called to live differently and live their lives treating their physical bodies no longer as slaves to pleasure, but as Paul would remind them, as a temple of the Holy Spirit. So these three things now establish a new moral code. And at first... These three things seem much easier than following the 613 commands of the law, but it cuts deeper. This apostolic decree from the Council of Jerusalem cut to the core of culture, called them to put their culture to the side. And I think it's a good moment for us to pause and ask ourselves something. What have we sacrificed for our relationship with Jesus? What have we laid down to follow Jesus before we're quick to judge other people and their relationship with Jesus. Yes, salvation is a free gift from God, but it will cost you everything. It'll cost you everything. You don't believe me? Listen to the first century apostles. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was in prison, and history would tell us he was later executed. Stephen was stoned to death. James was thrown off the roof of the temple. Matthew was killed by the sword. John, the writer of Revelation, was boiled alive. He survived, and then he was banished for the rest of his life to a prison island. Following Jesus and proclaiming his salvation and this new moral code around the world cost these men and women everything. They laid down their lives, and we are called to what? Pick up our cross and follow Jesus. So you have to ask yourself, What have you sacrificed? What have you laid down? What have you set aside? How have you lived your life different from the culture around you in order to follow Jesus? This is the landscape of the book of Revelation. There's pain. There's hardship. Trouble and persecution. Why? Because they live by this new moral code. These letters speak directly to their realities, to their tears and to their pain, to their frustrations. These letters will talk about faith and culture and division and theological, sociological issues. So for the rest of our time today, I want to dive into one of these letters and to let it guide the rest of our time today. Revelation 2, verse 1 says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, we got to already pause. I already have to pause. We have to talk about Ephesus. It's the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. It's home to over 250,000 people. You accelerate what that would look like today, this would be a city of well over 6 million people. It was a crossroads of the ancient world where people are coming together from many different cultures. It's a very diverse community full of people with different customs, different beliefs, different temples, different places of worship. And yet, what's in the middle of it? There's a strong presence of Christians with a great church. And so John, under the inspiration, speaks for Jesus to this church and he says this, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. What he's saying is these letters are going to be written to seven churches that God will hold in his right hand. 
and they represent His light, and they will each be called a lampstand. And this is what God says. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Everybody's like, well, this is nice. He's complimenting. He keeps going. He says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. He keeps going. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. And everybody's saying, man, I thought we were getting a letter that was going to be pain. But Jesus says this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. So with each of these letters, you're going to see this calling out in a positive way of faith and works. And if you know anything about the book of James, those two go together. If you claim to have faith, there should be evidence of that faith in the works that you do for Jesus. We don't work to achieve our faith, but because we have faith, we work for God. And so with these letters, you see an acknowledgement of a lot of what's going well. But you're all, always going to see in these letters a hard truth, something that's not going well. Now, maybe you were taught this, maybe you've heard this before, but when Jesus speaks of them forsaking their first love, we might think that he's referring to their love for God. And this is where I would plead with you that context is so important. You have to read what is all being said. What did Jesus commend right before he said, you've forsaken your first love? What did he say? He said, you have persevered. You have endured hardships for who? For my name. And you have not grown weary. That doesn't sound like people who don't love God. They are right with God. They know God. They're seeking God. They're faithful when life is tough. So this is not speaking to their love for God. What is the angel telling them? This is speaking to their love for each other. It speaks to how they treat other people in the church who are worshiping right beside them. It speaks to how they treat people, uh-oh, that might be different from them. Again, let's remember what they were commended for inside the church. Jesus says to them, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not. And you can't just throw that word apostle around in the New Testament. These are people who were commissioned by Jesus. So people who claim to be an apostle, they called him out and said, you're not. You're a false teacher. <clears throat> he says, you guys are great at discerning. The people who claim to be teachers, who claim to tell you what you want to hear, and you tell them you're false teachers out. And he commends them for that, for standing for their faith. But I'll tell you, when you become good at calling people out for something being done wrong, it eventually leaks into your other relationships as well. Here's what I think Jesus is saying to them. If we aren't careful, testing can become judgmental very quickly. And if you aren't careful with that and your radar is always up to call out people for something wrong, you slowly find that compassion and patience are non-existent. And don't get me wrong, it's good to keep each other accountable. Everybody needs somebody in their life that can keep them accountable. It's good for this church that they have people keeping them accountable for doctrine and theology and practicing their faith. But it can become dangerous if we even use these words, well, I want to be iron sharpening iron, and that iron sharpening iron becomes judgmental and harsh. Without even knowing it, we begin to test everyone and their motives. We begin to feel like we need to tell people or we have the authority to tell people which behaviors and thoughts are good or bad. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, we need people in our lives that we have given permission to to call us out. But those relationships, listen, they cannot be founded on judgment and harsh words. Because without realizing it, we can become a group of people who are great at judging what others do and don't do. And we take compassion out of the relationship altogether. This was a problem in Ephesus, and it can be a problem today. Think of it this way. How would you answer if someone were to ask you this question today? Are you right with God? How would you perceive that question? Would you think immediately about how guilty you feel? People love when the pastor asks them this question. 
Because they always say, well, I'm, just let me know, I'm going to tell you the last time that I prayed, and they can't even get like, the words out. This is how long I prayed. Or they say, to remember the last time they read the Bible. I mean, if somebody asked you, are you right with God, what, how, what would come to your mind? Here's the challenge that should be cutting to our hearts right now. How would you answer if someone were to ask you today, are you right with God? Would you think about your personal relationship with God and... Would you also think about where you're at with your family and with all the relationships that God has placed in your life? It's not and or, it's both. We should be deeply convicted by this warning from Jesus. How are we seeing the people that we disagree with? Maybe let's go a little bit deeper. How do we treat the people we disagree with on certain things. Remember, this is inside the church. How do we talk to them? How do we interact with them? How do we talk about them? Let's get real. How do we talk about them when they're not around? This matters to God because community matters to God. So he doesn't just leave them there. He says, listen, I, I have found fault. You have forsaken your first love for each other. But every letter, he'll tell them what needs to happen. Verse 5, he says, remember, remember the height from which you have fallen. Then he says, repent and do the things you did at first. And here's the warning. If you do not repent, this is Jesus speaking with authority. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. What's Jesus saying in a nice poetic way? If you don't do this and make things right, I will remove your influence from the world around you. There's some challenges that we have as Jesus writes this letter to the church. And if you like alliteration, you'll love this. Three challenges. We remember, we repent, and then we resume. Number one, we remember. He says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Do you know one of the ways that we can mend relationships, especially relationships that have soured? This isn't earth shattering, but take the time to remember when it was good. Take time to remember. He says, remember the heights from which you have fallen. Now, I would say this to us inside the church. When a relationship sours inside the church, you need to remember. Maybe remember the moments where you prayed together at the altar. Maybe you need to remember the moments where you served together, where you rolled up your sleeves and you pulled weeds on the church work day, or you filled 10,000 eggs for an Easter egg hunt, or you cleaned up after an event, or you were here early for an event and you served together and you got to see the work blossom into something beautiful. Maybe if it's a relationship that has soured inside the church, remember the late night phone calls and they answered and they prayed with you. Or when you went to the hospital, they were there with you. Remember. Now, I'll be really honest. The last two years have fractured, complicated, and ended so many relationships inside the church. Inside the church. Because I think we tend to forget when things are kind of calm how different we really are from one another. But when you turn the volume up and the world goes crazy, we become hyper aware of how different we are. And those are the moments where we get closer together and not allow our differences like I've seen to push us away from each other. Here's a newsflash for you. In case you didn't know, you are worshiping with people today who don't agree with you all the time. Let me say it again. You are worshiping with people today. You can look around. Don't look at somebody specific. But you are worshiping every week with people who don't agree with you all the time. Can we be real? We have different views on politics. We have different views on parenting. We each have a different work ethic, don't we? Uh-oh, we have different views on COVID and masks. So many things that should not have separated us have. 
And we have forgotten. We chose not to remember. Let us not become people who judge and use harsh words and then watch the compassion in our hearts disappear into nothing. So what do we do? We create moments. Maybe for the first time in a long time, and maybe you're sitting there saying, well, I'll do it if they do it. Maybe you need to be the one to initiate and to say, we need to sit down with each other. Guess what? Just like we do at communion, we sit down, we break bread. You want to make an awkward meeting less awkward? Let me give you a real practical tip. Eat some food. Some good food. Some good coffee. And say, today, we're going to talk. Maybe today we just catch up on life and we don't talk about the elephant in the room and we just get together so that we can do what? That we can remember our love. Jesus is telling them, remember how it used to be and how far you have fallen. So we remember. Number two, we repent. Now, repent is a very deep theological word. Lots of definitions. You know if a Greek word has a lot of definitions, it's a really important one. Repent is speaking of turning around. It also speaks of turning towards. It speaks of walking towards, and it talks about changing of mind. So I, we all know it's important to repent and get our hearts right with God. But what Jesus is saying to this church and to us is just as important to repent with other people and make things right. Advice from my mom. I give this to you for free all the time. I should start charging. I should write a book and charge for it. When I had something wrong with somebody in my family, somebody that was a friend, she would say, well, why don't you be the bigger person and you make it right? And of course I would say, yes, mother, you speak so wisely and I will do that. I said, no, I don't want to. They hurt me. They did. She said, I'm not asking you to play the blame game. You be the bigger person. So what do we do when we need to repent with each other? See, when we repent with those people that we've had disagreements with or that we've been hurt by or their relationship is so sour that we can't even stand to be around them, we do the same thing that we do with God. We need to turn around. We need to turn towards them and we walk towards them. So let's be honest. When we have disagreements, we'll just call it that because some are way more than disagreements. When we have disagreements with each other, what do we do? Do you know what one person does? One person faces this way. And one person faces that way. And maybe they'll go like this. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I forgive you. We might say it. But do you know what we never do? We never turn towards each other. And make things right. We don't walk towards each other. And if your backs are turned to each other, there's no room for reconciliation. We walk away. We say things over our shoulder, under our breath, in our minds, but not in our mouth. And things really aren't right, are they? He says to them, repent. I'll read it to you again. He says, repent and do the things you did at first. Repent means even when we disagree, even when we have ought, even when their relationship is so sour and, Pastor, you can't believe what they did to me, what they said to me, what they said about my kids or did to my kids. Repent means we come to each other. We move towards each other. We walk that awkward road towards each other and we ask God to change our heart and our mind. Because in the kingdom of God, we are called to share grace and truth with one another. That phrase, one another, I would love to do a series on that because there's 53 one another's just in the New Testament alone. It tells us that we cannot live in the kingdom of God without each other. Because we focus so much on the vertical, we forget about the horizontal. We're called to share in grace and truth. We lean into each other until things are right. Ouch. I guarantee you, if it's a relationship that's very sour, one lunch at Panera Bread is not going to work. It'll at least make it a little bit less awkward, and then you'll call your spouse on the way home and be like, I cannot even believe, like, I offered to pay for lunch, and they got the most expensive thing on the menu. I thought things were going to get better. All I got was a coffee because I thought they were paying we do this. We have to lean in until things are right. As we pray about asking God to forgive us, we need to say, God, is there anyone that I need to forgive? 
We do this in the midst of our diversity. Our diversity is a beautiful thing. We do this in the midst of the differences of our opinions, which is a beautiful thing. And we walk together in God's love. Here's a huge siren that's blaring as I read this. Remember, the book of Revelation, this specific letter is not written to the entire world. It's written to the church, to believers, to the body of Christ. So I have a hard question for you to answer. Is there a relationship in your life or in the church that needs repentance? Has it been good enough for you for a long time to just say sorry, but never turn towards the other person and allow reconciliation to truly take place? Here's the big challenge. Who do you need to talk to today? Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not when they call me. Not when they say, well, they heard the same message, so I'll wait for them to call me. Who do you need to talk to? Who do you need to turn towards? Because this is what Jesus says. He tells them, if you don't, I'll come to you and I'll remove your lampstand from its place. So we remember. We repent. And then he says, we resume. He says, go back to what you did before. Do the things you did at first. See, we think of love as just kind of like an emotion. But love actually grows out of committed action. So in order to get back to the kind of love we once had, resume the things you did before. Work through the repentance. Make the relationship right. Because it's not enough to just remember how things used to be and celebrate. It's not even enough to just repent and turn towards each other with forgiveness and love. We need to make a concerted effort to resume the friendship, to resume the relationship. And I think here's a true mark of somebody who has really worked on forgiveness. Can you be in relationship now and not talk about the past ever again? It's done. I thank God that we serve a God who when He says you are forgiven, He doesn't keep bringing it up. Even when He might be angry with me. Because we're good at that, aren't we? Don't, don't bump anybody, but we're good at that. We'll reconcile a relationship and then we have a bad day and they have a bad day and they'll say, well, I remember what you did in 1947. Like, that, that, stop. We, we resume how the friendship used to be. So I think there's a bigger call to this because there might be some people here today or watching today that have paused their relationship with other people. Real matter of fact, today's the day to resume that relationship. There are some people who have also paused their relationship with God. And sometimes we do that because of the broken relationships that we have with God's people. That's probably the number one thing that breaks my heart and should break yours. It's because of a relationship or something that was said or did inside the church. And we're a bunch of sinners. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to hurt each other. But it breaks my heart when somebody says, if that's how God's people act, then I can't love God. See, the, God didn't make the mistake. People did. So if you have to mend a relationship, do that. If you have paused your relationship with God and you're just here going through the motions or you're just watching because it's what you're supposed to do, don't pause your relationship with God because of a relationship you've had with somebody. It's time to resume that relationship once again as well. And I love how Jesus, when he was confronted and asked about the 613 commandments in the Old Testament, he was so good and when people set traps for him. See, if somebody set a trap for me, I would need to retire to my office for a week to process my answer. He was quick. They said, hey, Jesus, what's the most important commandment in all of the law? You see where the trap is? If he says don't murder, then they're like, sweet, we can lie. We can steal. Jesus was quick, and he was so intentional. In fact, he quoted the Shema prayer of the Old Testament and added to it. He said, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then what did he say? And the second is as, as important as the first. You love your neighbor as yourself. It's as if Jesus was saying, if you want to be great at letting the world know that you love God, you better be as great at loving people. And this is what this letter is telling us. 
So here's how I will end and ask you this question. What does it look like for you to come back and resume that broken relationship? I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe it can't happen today because there's years and years of hurt. I get that. I'm not trying to force you to do something that your heart's not ready for. But maybe the first step today is you start to remember. Because if the relationship has soured it, it tells me at one point it was pretty sweet. If it's soured, it means if it hurts now, it means it must have meant something important to you. So maybe you're like me and you need to write it down. Remember what it was like. Remember if that person, the relationship is sour now, but they were the person you could have called for prayer. Write it down. And then you make the choice to say, repentance has to happen. It's not going to be comfortable. I might have to ask somebody else for their number because I deleted them out of my phone. I get it. But I'm going to do the hard work to make this right. I'm not going to face one way and they face the other way. I I want us to face each other. And then to say, I'm going to resume this relationship. But I also want to ask, what does it look like for you to come back and resume your relationship with God? Same thing. Remember what it was like. Remember how He saved you. How He gave His life for you. The blessings that He has poured out, some you don't even realize. And if repentance needs to happen, the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and He will forgive us. One scripture speaks, He'll remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. And then what do you do? Because a lot of times we'll ask for forgiveness and then we're the ones who carry the guilt with us all the time. You resume the relationship like it's day one. So do you have to resume a broken relationship? Start today. Do you need to resume your relationship with God? Start today. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Revelation that has probably gotten so many negative reviews, so many different opinions. God, some of us won't even read it because we're not even sure if we understand it. But God, there's beautiful moments in the beginning of this book that it's you speaking to these churches that have endured tremendous amounts of pain, that are under persecution right now. And you speak to them and you tell them what you see. And then you warn them what needs to change so that you won't have to remove the light from their lampstand. And God, we celebrate today that some of these churches are still standing today in 2022. Maybe they did what was right. Maybe they heeded the warning and their lamps are still burning bright. God, I pray that we as a church, as a collection of people, not a building, but a collection of people, the church around the world right now, God, I pray that we would listen to these warnings. Lord, that you would not have to do the hard moments of removing the light from our lampstand. God, maybe we're good at calling people out when they don't follow Jesus. Maybe we're great at discerning when people are false teachers. Maybe we're great at enduring through tough circumstances and we're faithful to you. But God, sometimes we forget about the compassion of the people sitting next to us or in front of us or behind us. Maybe today we carry the burden of a relationship that has been soured. We carry around the hurt, not from somebody outside the church or from somebody that doesn't love Jesus. We carry her from somebody inside. And it's awkward And it feels different. And if we're honest, sometimes it affects our worship. It affects how we serve or if we choose to serve. That's not what you have for us, God. You want us to be a bright, shining lamp. Like a city on a hill that will point people to the light of the world. So God, I pray that if it has to start this way, help us remember. Bring back those good memories. Remove the stomach ache that comes when somebody says their name. And if we have to, Lord, may we be the bigger person and turn towards them and start the work of repentance and reconciliation for as long as it takes. And then to make a conscious decision to say, today, we resume. We resume the relationship. And God, if our relationship with you has been soured because of a relationship inside the church, would you remind us of who you are? 
that we don't put our hope in people. That even in the Old Testament, we don't put our trust in chariots and horses. We put our hope in the name of the Lord our God. May our relationship with you be what's so strong in our hearts that it will help us remember and repent and resume those relationships. Lord, we thank you that you inspired John to write these letters. We thank you for the influence of churches like Ephesus that still have their effects felt around the world today. And God, we heed this warning and we're listening. Help us to be great at still shining our lights very brightly. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said together,